All right, so we're moving on with the topic of radioactivity and interaction with tissues. And when, I, when I'm saying interaction with tissues, this does not include the radiation biophysics, which is the target, the target theory, the molecular theory. This does not include that. This does not include that. This is just from uh, you guys at Debertson, uh, lecture, lecture 9 and 10, 9 and 10. So this is what we're going to review, some questions from past papers, and I've got quite a few collected for you. So by all means, let's get started. And what I'd like you to do at this point, we've got fill in the blanks and relation analysis, and I'd like you to pause this video now and try and figure these on your own. So pause this video now. Very good, let's get started. Radiation associated with high, ion high ionization density is blank. And really, uh, like I told you in the videos, they're only going to have you compare alpha to beta or alpha to gamma, not really beta to gamma so much because they're somewhat similar as far as, uh, as, as the ionization density maybe and maybe some penetrability. But when we're saying ionization density, this means let. It's synonymous. And really, the particle that has the highest lead that we've encountered is the alpha, alpha particle, or alpha decay. Such radiation has a mass number of, and we know an alpha particle, we should know by now, has two protons and two neutrons, and this would be a mass number of four. Four. Mass number, mass number of four. Very good. So blank and blank are considered indirectly ionizing radiations. And we should know by now that we know that, that gamma, gamma photons, gamma photons are indirect, uh, indirectly ionizing radiation. And if you're not sure why, maybe you'd want to review the video about that. And sometimes people get confused and wonder, what's the other one? Well, the other one is, is, is x-rays, x-ray photons, x-ray photons. And just a reminder, hard x-rays can have the same frequency and energy as gamma x-rays. So don't get confused. The only difference between them is the source is the source, whereas gamma, X, uh, gamma rays are due to nuclear, and its source is nuclear, due to nuclear interactions, and X-rays are due to electric interactions, and that's its origin. Very good. The mechanism of attenuation observed only in a photon having more than one mega electron volt is, and this is the, uh, the most uh, destructive, you can say, or the, the most dramatic uh, mechanism, it would be the pair production pair production, and it would, it would entail uh, having, over, uh, having an energy equivalent of over 1.02 mega electron volts. Very good. Decay that changes the atomic number, but not the mass number is called, and we should know that. And with decay, a lot of people often get confused. And consider some sort of beta decay, maybe a beta negative decay, maybe a beta negative decay, where a neutron spontaneously decays into a proton. And in order to maintain the, uh, the uh, energy, it needs to uh, maintain the charge and the energy. It needs to emit the negative energy to maintain neutra neutrality. So really, what we're doing here is we're emitting, we're emitting an electron. And a neutron turns into a proton. So we're not really losing neutrons and protons as a whole. Our, our mass number stays the same. Because if I'm, if I'm taking an isotope and it's going through some sort of beta decay, or let's say a beta negative decay, where a neutron turns into a proton, the total number of neutrons, total number of neutrons combined with the total number of protons is going to stay the, is going to stay the same, is going to stay the same before and after this process. And this is important to understand. It's often asked about. It's often asked about. Very good. So decay that changes the atomic number, but not the mass number, is called beta decay. And this could be either beta negative or beta positive. Very good. A detector using a crystal and a photomultiplier tube is called. There's no real, re no real way to get an intuition behind it. It's just remembering it's called the scintillation, scintillation detector. detector. And that's what we use for different, uh, for different diagnostic tools. And you should really get familiar with this because we're going to deal with this quite a lot. Uh, so let's, let's move on to the relation analysis. And this would be a good time to pause it if you haven't tried those. So let's get started. And what I like to do is just, I like to take one comment, or rather one, one statement at a time and, and look at it. The biological and physical half-lives of a nucleus are linearly proportional to each other. Really, what does that mean? 
the biological half-life and the physical half-life. And really biological, you can say metabolism, excretion, secretion, metabolism, metabolism. And physical half-life is decay, decay, uh, or radioactive decay. And really, when radioactive decay goes up, let's just say it's, it's really quick, the decay rate, that doesn't mean that the biological system is going to, to have higher metabolism or it's going to secrete it quicker and vice versa. If the, if the biological system works faster with its metabolism, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even mean anything about the isotope decaying faster. So really, they're two different, they're two different ideas. And they're not really linearly proportional to each other. That would be incorrect. Very good. Because an undecayed nucleus cannot leave the human body as a result of metabolism. That, and if we're looking at it, the biological half-life really means the time by which half of the amount of the, of the uh, isotope is um, degraded out of the system via metabolism, secretion, excretion. So really, an undecayed nucleus can leave the human body as a result of metabolism. That's what biological half-life really means. False. Very good. Moving on. The energy distribution of beta negative radiation is discrete. Let's take a look at that. And we, we already mentioned what discrete and, uh, and continuous is. And if you don't remember that, maybe you'd want to review the videos. But very shortly, whenever you have an X amount of energy that only, that only this particle gets, that only this particle gets, that means this particle is going to get all of this energy, all of this energy. But if you have an X amount of energy that's distributed between two particles unevenly, this means that any one of these particles can get anywhere between a zero and a hundred percent of this energy because it's distributed. So anywhere between, and we're talking about some sort of some sort of integral, anywhere between a range, this would be continuous because they can get infinite, infinite, uh, infinite, you can say radiation packets. Anywhere between this, it could be nine percent. And between 9 and 10 percent, there's infinite amount of numbers. You can say there's 9.9 .9 and 9.8 .8 and so on and so forth. So really, when we're talking about beta, beta decay, beta decay features two particles, the uh, beta negative, the electron, and the antineutrino, or the beta positive, the positron, and the neutrino. And because there are two and they're both taking some sort of share of this energy, it's going to show us a continuous spectrum, not a discrete, continuous, continuous. So this would be false. Very good. A neutrino is emitted along with the beta negative particle. And this is just a game of remembering what does beta negative come with. It comes with an antineutrino. And beta positive comes with a neutrino. So when we're talking about um, beta negative particle, a beta negative particle comes with an antineutrino, not a neutrino, not a neutrino. You can say anti, anti here. So this would be also false. Moving on. All isotopes are radioactive. Well, that, that doesn't mean a whole, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm, all the isotopes in my body don't, don't radiate ra radioactive. It doesn't make any sense at all. We have hydrogen that, that I have in my body. I have oxygen as well. I have carbon as well. And these are not necessarily radioactive. There is a radioactive uh, isotope of hydrogen, uh, tritium, and there is a radioactive isotope of oxygen and carbon, but that doesn't mean everything is radioactive. So this is false, really, this is false. And by isotopes, any, anything, any element has isotopes. It doesn't mean that an isotope is radioactive. Carbon-12 carbon, carbon 12 that I have in my body a whole lot is an isotope. It's not radioactive, but it is an isotope. Because neutron is negatively charged, and neutron is negatively charged, this, right out the bat, hopefully this, this sounds stupid to you because in the nucleus, we have neutrons and protons, and protons are positively charged, and neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. All right, moving on. And there's quite a bit, quite a lot of questions here. So I want to take your time again, pause this video, and work on it. And you can just pause it and take your time, maybe take a break. All right, let's get started with it. And we've got some more relation analysis here, so let's kink them out. In a Geiger-Muller counter, High energy gamma particles generate a bigger pulse than low energy gamma particles. And I know that I haven't covered Geiger and Muller uh, yet, but what, what's important to understand is that in a Geiger and Muller counter, all that it does is it, it, it measures ionization. It doesn't me measure the energy of the incident particles causing ionization. If I have super energetic gamma ray and maybe less energetic gamma ray, they're both going to cause ionizations. 
or rather, <laughs> they're both going to cause ionizations, right? And I can measure these ionizations. This is what I measure. I can't measure this. So it is incorrect to say that a Geiger Muller counter is going to show me the different, different energy levels. So a higher energy gamma particle is not going to generate a bigger pulse. I'm not, I'm not going to get a bigger pulse. All I'm going to measure is ionization. And when you think about it, take a look at the second statement. The counter is an ionization detector. That is true. That is true. That's all it detects. It detects ionization, not energy. Where is it? Not energy. False and true. Very good. Moving on. Nuclear of elements flows to the iron and the periodic table are very stable. Well, this pertains to this little graph. I'm not going to really fully draw it now, but there's, there's a little curve going up here. And iron, iron 56 is up, is up here, and everything next to it is kind of going down. And on this axis, you see um, binding energy per nucleon. I'm not really going to draw this, but this is binding energy per nucleon. And anything that's really close to, to the, uh, as far as atomic mass to this element is going to be fairly stable because it is fairly high on the binding energy per nucleon axis. So this is true. Anything in the periodic table that's close to iron is going to have an a mass number uh, close to iron. So this would be true. This would be true. Nuclei of, elements, nuclei of elements close to iron in the periodic table are very stable. Agreed. Agreed. Because of that ratio and other factors, maybe. The binding energy per nucleon is the highest for these elements. And this is exactly what it is. On the y-axis, I have binding energy per nucleon. And the higher you are on this axis, the more stable you are. And anything close to iron is going to be higher on the y-axis. If this is far away, maybe it's lower on the, low, on the, on the y-axis. But this is closer to iron, so it's higher on the y-axis. True. And these explain one another, so essentially it would be an A, meaning statement A explains statement B well. Very good. Let's kink those true or false off. Let's take them out. A gamma knife is a diagnostic application of radioactive isotopes. And really, when you're thinking about it, if I have someone lying here, this is someone's head, and there's, there's a gamma knife around it, and it's radiating uh, gamma rays somewhere here into an incident intersection, really what it is doing, it is, it, it is irradiating uh, a tumor or some sort of tissue. And this is not really diagnostic. I'm not trying to see what's going on. I'm trying to take care of it. This is a therapeutic, therapeutic application of radioactive isotopes using cobalt-6. So this would be false. It's not diagnostic. Not true. The energy spectrum of alpha radiation is discrete, a line spectrum. And these, these are really synonymous. Discrete and line spectrum are the same thing. And I covered it very gingerly in this explanation. But really, if I have an X amount of energy, it's only given to one particle. Because an alpha, an alpha particle does not come with an antineutrino or a neutrino or any other particle uh, in that sense. So all the energy is going to be imparted. So it's going to have a discrete packet of energy. True. The effective half-life is always going to be shorter than the physical half-life. And this is a point of confusion often. Let's think about it this way. The effective half-life is really the culmination or the combination of the physical half-life and the biological half-life. Really what it means is, if I'm asking what is the effective half-life of, of of isotope X. This means I'm asking how long would it take for, for, uh, for um, X to degrade by either physical means or biological means. So really, if I'm, if I'm taking this one, let's just take this one. How long does it take to decay? And then I'm asking how long does it take to decay or uh, degrade via metabolism, excretion, or secretion? This is always going to be faster because this is a combination of two processes. These two processes are working to degrade the amount of material. So if I combine them, it's going to take, it's going to take less time to be degraded. So the effective half-life is, in effect, going to be always shorter. It's going to always be shorter than any of these, than, than the physical or the biological. And it's going to be the same as the combination of both. Very good. Moving on. And here, and here we have... Uh, quite the more complicated question here. It's a very long essay question. I believe it was right around 17 or 16 points. So you can think that out of 60, it's quite a bit. And we have a multiple choice here that may have or may not have more than one correct answer. So you've got to figure out what's correct. So I want you to pause this video now and take your time and work on these. See if you can nail those. Very good. Let's get going with those.
multiple choice. The mass number decreases by 2 during alpha decay. And we're talking about alpha particle. The mass number we already mentioned, you have, we have two protons, two neutrons, two neutrons here. So the mass number is 4. It's not decreased by 2, it's decreased by 4. This is incorrect. This is not true. Very good. Moving on. The mass number does not change during beta decay. And they didn't really specify what beta decay, and that is fine because at any beta decay, we may have, in a, in a, um, let's say, a neutron turns into a proton. And this is negative beta decay. This is negative beta decay. The total number of neutrons gathered, uh, added with the total number of protons does not change. Or when a proton turns into a neutron in beta positive decay, beta positive decay, this is beta negative decay, it should be here, very good. This also does not change the total number of neutrons and protons. So the mass number does not change during a beta decay. It's important to understand. This is true. This is good. This is good. So this is something that you really need to get to get to understand because they asked about it often, as you may see. Moving on. The atomic number increases by one during beta decay. The atomic number is really the, part of the number of protons. And let's take a look what beta decay is. Beta decay is when a proton spontaneously turns into a neutron and emits its positive charge. Emits its positive charge plus positron, positron, or you can just say plus beta positive particle. Either way, my atomic number is decreased by one. And what do they say here? It increases by one. That is incorrect. That is not true. Moving on. The mass number increases by one during K electron capture. But when you think about it, I only went to the basics of uh, K capture, which is more than enough for answering this question. What I have is an electron that is captured into the nucleus, into the nucleus, and a proton captures this electron, so to speak. It's not the proton itself, but a proton is rendered into a neutron during K capture. During K capture, proton plus electron, you can say, uh, turns into a neutron. So we're losing the atomic number by one. It, it does not increase, it decreased by one, decreased by one. Incorrect. Moving on. The atomic number increases by one during beta negative decay. Let's see, we have the beta negative decay here. A, a neutron spontaneously turns, decays into a proton. So our number of protons, the atomic number increases by one. So this would have to be correct. This would have to be correct. Very good. All right, so if you haven't paused the video to try and work on this, Take your time to do so because this is quite the question. This is quite the question. So I'm going to start dealing with it now. Plot in the same coordinate system the effective and physical decay of a radioactive isotope in a living system as a function of time. Indicate if you use linear or logarithmic scales. It may seem difficult, but really it isn't. It's the same graph that we've seen ever since the beginning of the x-ray presentation. We're going to have on our on our, oh my god, this is horrible. Very good. On this axis, on this axis, I'm going to have this here, and I'm going to explain it in a second. And this is time. Very good. And what we're going to see is just two curves, two curves. The, let's just say, this is the effective half-life, and this is the physical, physical half-life. And actually, what's important to do, and I'm just going to do it here, I'm not going to half-ass it for you. This is one. Very good. Make sure it's, it's solid and it looks good, just so you can actually work with it. Very good. So what I'm going to, first of all, state is I'm going to write the formula here so we can interpret the variables. And they always ask for that whenever you ask, you, you draw this graph. Very good. And this is just like the I, I, zero, E, minus, mu, X, da, da, da. This is the exact same thing. It only looks a little different. But really, what this means is this N here is the number of undecayed isotopes. So the isotopes I have left, undecayed, decayed isotopes at time of investigation, at time of investigation, and time of investigation. And N0 is the, uh, is the initial, initial amount of radioactive isotopes, initial, initial amount or initial number of radioactive isotopes, radioactive isotopes, active iso, iso for isotopes. This is the, this here is the decay constant, decay constant, and this is the time. 
So let's see what's going on. On this axis we have, we have the number of undecayed over the initial number at this point. And in, in the beginning it's going to start at 1. Why is it going to start at 1? Because before they started decaying, if I had 100 isotopes, if I had a, a hundred isotopes in the beginning, at time zero, before they started decaying, at time of investigation in the beginning, they're also going to be the same number. So before they started decaying, I'm um, right here, and this is why the graph starts from the value of one on the y-axis. Super important, super important. Obviously, I'm using, um, I'm, I'm using an exponential logarithmic scale. I'm not using a linear scale because it's, it's not a very good representation. You can do that, but I don't like to because it's just, not, in essence, what is going on. So let's try and label these. We already said one of them is going to be the, uh, the effective and one of them is going to be the physical. And right out the bat, I'm going to tell you that this one is the effective curve and this one is the physical, the physical curve. And by, by curve, I mean the, uh, the half-life curve, so to speak. And in order to, to make that, in order to hit that point home, I'm going to, to indicate this is 100%. This is the... 50% or 0 0.5. This is the half-life. And I'm going to, to get a curve going here. All right. And you can already see, you can already see here that at this point for the effective half-life, at this point, at this point in time, I already have half of my half of my isotopes degraded. Whereas just by the physical, I, I have at that point more uh, at that point in time, I'm going to need more time to get to that half, half level. So this means that this takes longer. As you can see, it takes longer. Very good. So what were we asked to do? Plot the same curve, da, 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 effective and physical decay. We already did that. So we, we already labeled those. And a living system is a function of time. Indicate if you use da, da, da. Write the, quest, the equation describing the above graph. This is it. Very good. We already did that. We already described that. They always ask for it. And even if they don't ask for it, I'm just going to write it here Maybe just to make sure the professor knows what I'm talking about. He knows what I'm talking about. Label the physical half-life and physical lifetime of the radioactive isotope in the above graph. So we already mentioned this, this point. This point is the physical, physical half-life. Half -life. Because this is the point. This is the point in time. This is the point in time by which half, half of my isotopes were degraded by physical means. Very good. And the physical lifetime, really, is just the time by which it takes the number of isotopes to degrade to 37%, or if you want to be pedantic, 36.367, or you can say 36 or 37. You'll see it in different ways. But really, it takes a little bit longer to get to that, as you can imagine. It takes a little bit longer. And this is going to be right here, my physical lifetime. Physical lifetime, physical lifetime, lifetime, perfect. Now, this is not a very good time. All right. So this is pretty much what we're talking about. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense to you. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense to you. And um, we'll see you in the next video.